So now we will start with uh, Yu Yang Lin, which, who will present uh, a, a contribution uh, uh, with Nikos Tsevelenkos. Uh, so Yu Yang, please, on live, uh, start your talk. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'll share my screen now. Okay, uh, oops, that was uh, from testing. There, can you see it? Yes, everything is okay, thank you. All right, hello, uh, I'm uh, Yu Yang. I'll be talking about uh, some work I did with uh, Nikos on verifying higher order programs. Um, we approach this from a game semantics perspective. Um, to start, uh, let me summarize what we are trying to achieve with the work I'll be presenting here. Uh, the objective is to check stateful higher order programs, uh, particularly stateful higher order libraries uh, for errors. Um, I will define the library paradigm later, so what I mean by libraries, but for now, uh, think of libraries as collections of methods. This means that uh, libraries run, well, must run by definition, inside some unknown environment that calls them. Um, uh, to clarify, uh, references are higher order in the sense that they may store methods. And uh, lastly, by bugs, we also um, specifically mean um, assertion violations. So we shall we shall only be uh, checking safety properties. Uh, to expand a bit on the, the higher order errors, um, here is uh, the intuition for what I what, what makes um, here's a bit of intuition for what makes high order errors difficult to handle. Um, on the left, I have a an instance of a first order bug. Um, checking this program for errors is a matter of finding a ground type value for x that may cause an error. Uh, in this case, any integer above zero would do, for instance. Um, note that this is a closed program in the sense that the only three variables are of ground type. Therefore, all code that is uh, old code um, is known. So there's no unknown code. As a result, all contexts are also known. Um, the only missing part is, um, is a ground type value. In contrast, the higher order bug on the right uh, depends on some function g. This means that not all code is available to um, explicitly run. Um, as a result, a counterexample for this is actually a higher order term, or rather a context that defines g and defines how f would be used. Um, in addition um, to having to guess the top level context, uh, any interim context we may reach are also undefined context, uh, which we also need to guess. Um, this all makes higher order uh, reasoning quite, quite expensive. Um, but before we continue, um, reasoning about, since reasoning about higher order uh, programs is expensive, uh, why should we check higher order? Uh, for high order errors were, well, here's uh, a motivational example that shows a real world need for finding um, high order um, errors. Uh, I should say here that uh, smart contracts are not the focus of our work, but serve as a good example. Um, well, here I have the, uh, the, DAO, um, the DAO attack. Uh, the DAO was a, um, well, a DAO, as defined there, in the Ethereum platform, uh, which are basically a set of scripts that function somewhat like a bank. Um, here I have written a simplified version of their withdraw function in Python. The withdraw function takes as arguments a user and an amount, uh, checks if the user has um, enough money, and um, sends, that, sends them that amount. Um, however, each user has their own send function. So uh, the users are allowed to basically tell others how to send them, fun uh, how to send them money by defining their own send function. Um, this means that to, uh, the call to send, which is uh, highlighted in bold there, passes control 
um, to an unknown environment, which may then re-enter the withdraw function whenever it wants. And uh, that is precisely what an attacker eventually did. Treating the DAO as a library, so as a collection of methods, uh, we define it as a well, library that um, has one method, withdraw. And then we can define an environment for it um, that bypasses the check for sufficient um, funds and then recursively calls a withdraw function indefinitely. The result was, uh, as you can see there, a loss of uh, 3.6 million ether, which at the time was approximately 150 million US dollars. Uh, the price of ether dropped, the network was forked uh, to undo the attack, and eventually, the, um, because people disagreed about it, uh, the network split into two. So our approach to find uh, these type of higher order bugs is to uh, combine symbolic execution with game semantics. I, I should note here again that uh, reentrancy types of bugs, uh, as mentioned the, before, are not the focus, but we cover the full range of, um, of higher order interactions. Um, it's just a good example to uh, show this. Yeah. Yeah, so we shall be working, as you can see there, uh, within a library client uh, paradigm. Um, the goal here is to check a, um, a higher order library without having to define a client for it. In other words, we shall be checking um, a library that is open with unknown functions. In this paradigm, um, libraries and clients interact with each other by answering pending calls or um, uh, calling. So they can either call or answer uh, pending calls. Uh, and the distinction between libraries and clients is simply made by the lack of a main method in libraries. Um, syntactically, they're just both defined as collections of methods, but uh, clients can be distinguished by the fact that they run. So they have a main method that runs. Uh, libraries don't run themselves, they need to be called. Um, a secondary objective uh, here is that we also wanted to be compositional in the sense that uh, we want to check if uh, we may want to check each component independently and then compose the results to find um, errors in the composite system. Um, however, as you shall see later, this is actually a requirement for soundness and uh, completeness. As mentioned before, uh, libraries are simply collections of methods. Um, these are written here uh, as sequences of either um, abstract method declarations, blocks of public and private uh, or private method definitions, and global reference declarations. So you can see the syntax there. Um, since the references are global, uh, they need to be defined uh, beforehand. Uh, these method definitions in our libraries uh, are um, the method definitions in our library basically uh, are written uh, as higher order terms. So these higher order terms um, are defined as you can see here in the by the syntax and some typing rules. In our language, we have uh, assertions which take an integer and return unit. Uh, variables x, uh, method names m, integers i, unit, assignment, re-referencing, uh, lambda abstractions in application, binary arithmetic operations, which, you, which, uh, which we have left undefined as their definitions do not affect the theory, um, pairs, projection, um, conditionals, lead bindings, and lettric, as you would see in OCaml. Uh, note this strange uh, semicircular parentheses. Uh, we call this an evaluation box, and um, it, it just flags the place in the term where a call is pending. Uh, this is actually going to be used uh, for bounding execution. So this is why we we try to um, uh, place where uh, flag where a call has occurred. So now we look at the operational semantics. Configurations in our semantics are made up of a, a term that is going to evaluate. 
a method repository R, which is a map from uh, names to Lambda abstractions, a store S, uh, which is another map that goes from uh, references to values, and a call counter K, uh, which is a natural number. Um, this call counter counts the depth of call nesting. Since method application is the only source of infinite behavior, so infinite reductions, it suffices to bound the depth of calls to enforce uh, termination. To briefly go over um, some rules in our language, we shall be encoding booleans as zero and not zero. Uh, thus assertions uh, succeed if the I in this case is not zero and get stuck otherwise. Uh, if statements reduce to a then branch, if I is not zero or the else branch otherwise. Uh, someone more interesting are method application. Um, uh, are the rules for method application and uh, return, uh, which re the application records the nesting by wrapping the substitution with a uh, evaluation box, with an evaluation box, and incrementing the k counter by one. Uh, and then when it returns, which de um, it decrements the k by one um, after a value is reached inside uh, this, these evaluation boxes. Uh, the evolution context defined below is simply um, saying that this is a call by value semantics. For libraries, we define a game semantics in operational form, uh, which is a trace semantics that involves uh, game moves, um, specifically questions uh, written using these question marks and uh, and answers which are written using these uh, exclamation marks since games can typically go on forever because the environment is allowed to keep on calling uh, we bound the games using a counter l l counts what we call a chattering which is intuitively um, the size of the term being modeled by the opponent um, the reason why the proponent does not need to be bound in the same way is that uh, we expect terms to always be of finite size. The, the term given by the, the proponent would be finite. Um, so we would terminate by, um, by its size and the bound uh, set uh, previously. In our games, configurations extend the term configurations we saw before with a call stack uh, which is at uh, curly E, um, a public method set, which is a set of all names that have been leaked um, by the proponent to the environment, and an abstract method set, which is all of the method names provided by the environment. In this case, the opponent is the, uh, the environment and the proponent is the uh, library. With this, uh, let's look at the motivational example we defined uh, earlier. We now define uh, the withdraw function as a method in our library syntax. From this, we can build an opponent conf configuration as C0, where the funds start from 50, and uh, the only public names um, are the withdraw, and uh, the only abstract names are the send. Um, when trying to execute this in the semantics, uh, the only move available to the opponent at C0 is to call the only public name it knows, which is uh, withdraw. The opponent calls withdraw with uh, some number, in this case, uh, let's say 42. This adds withdraw to the stack um, and increments the counter L by one. The proponent then is able to evaluate internally until it reaches the undefined send function. It then passes control to the opponent who then immediately makes another call um, to withdraw. Um, 
the reason it has to pass control is because see, it doesn't have the proponent doesn't have the um, the code uh, to execute. So it, the only thing it can do is uh, pass control to the opponent. So in this case, the opponent decides uh, to call the re-enter the function, and again, the proponent is able to evaluate. Um, uh, once again, it has to pass control to the opponent because it doesn't have uh, the code to execute. And um, at this point, the opponent then decides that it has enough, it has had uh, enough, and just decides to return. Uh, with this, um, the proponent is able to evaluate until it reaches a value, um, which it can then return to the opponent. In this case, it's uh, just unit because the last um, the last uh, thing to execute was a, a, an assertion, which is a, a command. Um, and then the opponent decides again to just return to the proponent, um, which finally leads to the proponent being able to, to evaluate all the way down to an assertion, which in this case, it has to prove that a negative 34 is greater or equal than um, zero, um, which is obviously uh, not the case. Taking all of these uh, moves on the arrows, so all of the labels on the arrows, we can build a trace that is causing our error. Um, by definability of our games, which we um, shall prove, um, we can build a client from this trace, uh, which is seen here in green. Um, so all of the moves uh, taken uh, in the trace, it can be used to directly build this um, this context for uh, the library. As hinted uh, before, our games have been proven, were proven uh, sound and complete. Uh, by this, we mean that uh, all errors reachable in the library through our games correspond to a definable client C, such that composing the library L and the client C concretely leads to that error, and uh, vice versa. For this, we needed uh, compositionality and definability. Once um, definability and compositionality are shown, which is the uh, tricky part, uh, soundness uh, just uh, falls into place. You can see um, the um, compositionality um, definitions and uh, definability. The proof is actually uh, quite simple. You can actually see the whole intuition there at the bottom. Uh, so far, um, however, we have been only looking at concrete execution. Uh, our games, however, are infeasible to explore practically because they involve infinite branching due to integers. Uh, thus, to find uh, bugs in this setting, we chose uh, symbolic execution. Um, Symbolic execution amounts to executing a program using symbolic values in place of uh, free variables. Uh, the aim here is to use the symbolic environment um, sigma and a path condition PC to explore the entire computation tree of the program and accumulate constraints that decide, reach, uh, decide, uh, re decide reachability using an SMT solver. We chose a symbolic execution because its nature of exploring each path independently uh, made it easier to reason about high order traces. And uh, it also looks more similar to our operational semantics, which made it easier to combine with games. To give an example um, for symbolic execution, here I have a function f which uh, is defined by an if statement. We start with an empty sigma and a uh, PC, which is just true, uh, and then explore one branch. In this case, we explore the true branch. Um, if the condition is true, then we must add uh, the condition into the path condition. 
So we know that uh, PC is now equal to uh, x, uh, x less than five. Uh, we then up, uh, update the reference uh, R with X plus two in Sigma. Now we also explore the else branch. And uh, if the else branch is the case, uh, we negate the condition and add it into the path condition. Not that we're just uh, conjoining, but uh, because the path condition is true, uh, it just becomes the condition. And um, so we have uh, X is greater than or equal to five. And uh, similarly, we update R with uh, X plus three. So any model M that satisfies uh, Sigma and PC conjoint proves that the configuration uh, where we took the PC and the Sigma from is reachable. With this, we can produce a symbolic execution semantics for terms by extending the configurations with a Sigma and a PC and extending the terms with uh, some symbolic values, which we shall name Kappa in this case. So all of the instances of Kappa are symbolic values. Um, as we can see in the rules, branching is non-deterministically explored by assuming that Kappa is either zero or not zero. Um, we, as you can see, the rules add into PC, uh, the Kappa equals zero or not zero. And uh, the referencing uh, now grabs symbolic values found in Sigma and assignment uh, assigns symbolic values as well. Not that all, all of these uh, tilde uh, Vs, which are uh, symbolic values will, will, or symbolic or non-symbolic values will appear in Sigma as a result of some expression in SNT form. So all of the constraints defining um, the values that are that appear in the referencing will also appear inside the sigma. So with this, we can now build a uh, produce a symbolic execution game semantics for our libraries by allowing the presence of symbolic moves and extending the configurations with uh, sigma and PC. So you can see the configurations are the same as before. Um, the at the bottom, we can see the, um, the proponent and the opponent configurations. The only difference is the presence of sigma in place of uh, state S and the path condition in addition to the previous um, elements. So we can now come back to the DAO example once again. And uh, this time we explore it symbolically. As before, we start from a uh, C0 with a path condition equals true and uh, sigma containing um, only that the funds equal uh, uh, 50. Again, the only move is to call withdraw, but notice that now it's calling withdraw with a uh, some undefined value, uh, kappa one. The proponent evaluates internally until it reaches send. And again, it cannot do anything with it. So it has to pass control to the opponent. Um, from here, the opponent chooses to call withdraw again, so it re-enters the function, but notice that it also re-enters it with another symbolic value, uh, kappa 2. The proponent then follows by evaluating, evaluating internally until it reaches uh, send once again and passes control to the opponent. The opponent chooses then to return And the, uh, the proponent is able to evaluate all the way down to a value once again. After it returns, the proponent um, passes, uh, uh, by returning the proponent passes unit to the opponent and the opponent uh, returns once again. At this point, we can reach an assertion. Um, the proponent is able to reach an assertion by evaluating um, and in this case, the assertion uh, has to prove that funds, the the, um, the reference is greater than or equal to zero, where funds maps, in this case, uh, to 50 uh, minus kappa two minus kappa one. 
We thus have a path condition. Um, kappa 1 is less or equal to 50. Kappa 2, which is the reentrant call, uh, less or equal to 50. And an assertion, which is 50 minus kappa 2 minus kappa 1, is greater than or equal to 0. And we want to know if the negation of this assertion is reachable. We thus conjoin the PC with, uh, with the negation of the assertion. We then can see that the formula is satisfiable um, with a SAT solver if you want, but in this case, it's quite easy. If we uh, feed the values one as the first call uh, for kappa one, and then uh, we feed 50 for kappa two, so the reentrant call is 50, uh, we can show that this, uh, the formula is satisfiable, which means that the, uh, the negation of, our, of the assertion is reachable, so we can violate the assertion. Again, by definability, we have the green client defined here, which uh, concretely defines this error trace. Sorry, you younger, you you are going over time, so you have five, four minutes to for your session. Okay. Uh, so I'll uh, try to go through these quickly. Uh, for symbolic games, we also uh, wanted to show some uh, properties. In this case, we wanted to report that the technique reports only sound errors. By this, we mean uh, only true positives. Uh, for this, we have first uh, soundness of our games, which states that the concrete semantics agrees with the uh, operational semantics, the term uh, semantics. And secondly, that the con uh, correctness, uh, we, secondly, we show correctness, which states that the symbolic games agrees with the concrete games. Uh, from these two, one and one and two, we obtain sound errors. We implemented our symbolic games in the K framework, which is a framework that allows one to uh, implement uh, executable semantics as a rewrite system. We tested our tool on a benchmark of 70 higher order uh, programs using set three to prune, prune invalid paths uh, on the fly. Cumulatively, we found all errors in every file that was known to have an error and found uh, no errors in every file that was known to be safe. Uh, we call our tool uh, Holic for higher order libraries in K. Um, I'll show a quick demo, but uh, since I don't have much time, I'll go through this uh, quite quickly. There's not much to show. Um, we basically have the, um, the library implemented here in our um, language. And what we do is uh, we call K on this. So I shall be call calling K on this. As you can see here, uh, I'll call K run with a pattern, searching for fail and uh, returning a trace. And I'll uh, let that run for a bit. Um, so again, the uh, expected result is uh, to find a um, trace that uh, we described earlier. So this is a trace that is able to violate the assertion by calling first a withdraw with some unknown uh, symbolic value, calling send with that same value, calling withdraw again to re-enter it, calling send, uh, the proponent call sends to pass control, and then returning, returning, and returning as we previously saw. Uh, so to conclude, uh, using the symbolic games, we were able to feasibly find uh, higher order errors present in our benchmarks. Um, we also noticed that most errors are shallow, which requires uh, minimal bounds, uh, coupled with the fact that there seems to be a need for tools that are able to find higher order errors, even in small programs, as you can see in uh, smart contracts, which are small by design. It seems that uh, symbolic execution and uh, games uh, may be useful in practice. Um, for future work, um, our current technique is only two-part compositional, so proving full compositionality would allow uh, for modular verification, uh, which is where we, instead of composing the result uh, for verification, we could decompose actually a large program into smaller components that are easier to check. Um, finally, it seems the, uh, possible to finalize our symbolic games using either abstract interpretation or pushdown systems. However, we notice that these also incur a heavy loss in precision. Um, so, and there also seems to be a lot of engineering uh, needed to tweak the rate of false positives. And uh, with that, I'll, I can move to answering questions. 
Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Yu uh, Yang. Uh, so thank you for your talk. So maybe there is time for just one very short question. So I remember people that you can uh, address question either by the quick and answer box you have below, and that is a text question, I will uh, re read it. Otherwise by uh, raising your hands, but it seems to me that there, is, there are no hands raised. Okay, so since we are running over time, so thank you very much for your talk. Um,